Post-World War II global events, such as the Chinese Civil War, where communists under Mao Zedong were successful in taking control of the Chinese government, the successful detonation of an atomic bomb by the USSR, the deteriorating situation in Berlin, and the success of communism in North Korea created the impression that a red tide of communism was sweeping across the world. And the U.S. failure to prevent this was a sign that there must be something going on within the United States that allowed this to happen. Some Americans believe communism was sweeping through the United States in places like our government, our universities, our books, our movies, our sports, and on main streets across the United States. Democrats, and particularly President Harry Truman, pushed the Federal Employee Loyalty Program to make it appear that they were tough on communism, despite claims to the contrary made by Republicans. While the initial loyalty program targeted federal employees and applicants, it generated so much hysteria that it eventually filtered down to other parts of society and promoted fears of communist infiltration. It eventually led to a communist witch hunt upon all parts of American society. The FBI spied on college campuses where it f was felt that socialists and communist professors were indoctrinating the youth of America. Labor unions were infiltrated and recorded. Hollywood movies were parsed for their sympathetic themes towards socialist ideas. And books were combed for their communist ideas and sympathies. Eventually, all public employees, federal, state, and local, were forced to sign loyalty oaths. Within this maelstrom, the House Un-American Activities Committee was revived, which held congressional hearings to expose the communist influence in the United States. Anyone suspected of communist activity or sympathy could be called to testify. Those who testified and were asked as to whether they had ever been a member of the Communist Party had limited options. First, if they replied yes, they would be forced to name names. Second, if they said no, they were subject to charges of perjury. Last, if they invoked the Fifth Amendment, they were viewed by the public as a communist and were subject to blacklisting and ostracism. Critics of U.S. foreign policy, the LGBT community, teachers, writers, and movie directors sympathetic to socialist or foreign ideas, labor unions, and advocates for expanded civil rights for blacks had their loyalty questioned, and many lost their jobs, friends, and personal health as a result of this anti-communist crusade. Senator Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin represents a bit better than any other person the virulent underbelly of political hate in the United States and the push for conformity during the late 1940s and early 1950s. McCarthy, who falsely claimed to have been wounded in World War II to gain election, used the hysteria to further his political career and the prospects of Republican politicians by creating lists of supposed subversives working in the Truman administration. The lists were unsubstantiated and the Senate eventually ruled them a hoax, but the American public, in their need for conformity and their need for simplistic answers to complex questions regarding the Cold War and communism, provided an audience for McCarthy for far longer than he deserved. Only when McCarthy went after the United States Army did the public and government grow wary of his tirades. McCarthy was eventually censored, which had occurred only two times before in U.S. Senate history. However, his name lives on as the synonym for personal attacks on individuals by means of indiscriminate allegations, especially unsubstantiated charges and smear campaigns. As you read An Enemy of the People, consider why author Miller may have seen parallels between McCarthyism and the treatment of the play's protagonist, Dr. Stockman. How does the climactic town meeting scene demonstrate the type of abuse of the democratic process that so characterized the McCarthy era?